Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Let's let's pray and then we'll make a start. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the book of truth that opens to us the reality of you, how to find you, how to approach you. Thank you. Teach us and stir us with thirst to know you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're on the subject of prayer, and we're looking in the Christian's Compass in Chapter 7. And uh, in the Christian's Compass, I've got a brief introduction, and then there are six different areas that we look at. Uh, they are the teaching of Jesus on prayer. That's the first. Then the second, the example of Jesus in prayer. Thirdly, examples of prayer or an example of prayer in the Old Testament. Then fourthly, an example of prayer in the New Testament. Fifth, the teaching of Paul on prayer. And then finally, sixth, examples of prayer in history. And uh, we'll, we'll come to that uh, probably in a few weeks' time. I'm not sure how quickly we'll go through this. But the, the subject of prayer. Now, what is prayer? How can we define prayer? What is it? And the answer is um, <clears throat> prayer is talking to God. Um, that's the first way we can think of prayer, simply talking to God. It's very interesting when uh, Moses struck the rock the first time and water came out of the rock the rock was smitten that's a picture of christ crucified and then in numbers chapter 21 uh, i think it's chapter 21 he was went back to the rock and god said to him speak to the rock he didn't say shout he didn't say uh do do a lot of weeping and wailing to make the rock give forth its water just talk to it and uh, recently i was in a church where they had taught the people that to receive the holy spirit you had to uh, really humble yourself cry out to god and confess all your faults and they taught them that you would have to do this for several days before God would give you the Holy Spirit. And uh, I preached on that subject of uh, the rock smitten and how they were taught to speak to the rock. And that one of the great things about prayer is talking in our normal voice, just talking, not in an affected voice, not pretending anything. We'll come to that further in a moment but so prayer is at its base most basic level simply talking to god then we can also say that prayer is reaching out to god to discover him to meet with him i think my christian life my spiritual life began with a prayer god are you there and of course god answered <laughs> because uh, he led me to believers and he led me to uh, different places and eventually i discovered the reality of the living god but it began with a simple prayer and when you witness to somebody one of the wonderful things you can tell them is just talk to god reach out to him and and he and he will meet with you uh, then prayer is opening a door for god into our lives and circumstances if you think that i want god in my life that may be something that we we thirst to know him but it, we may be have a situation where there is a great need there's a great problem in our family or there's a great problem in our situation and when we pray we let god in and that's the great uh wonder of prayer that god in the mix changes everything um as, as long as we try and solve it on our own we're helpless we we might have this great sense we have to fix it 
a problem. But the truth is when God comes in, he says, I'll fix it. And all the resources of heaven are ours. All the resources of God are ours. All the supernatural, infinite power of God are ours. We just have to let God in to the, to the problem. And the, the prayer is opening a door. When you think of that, if you think of opening a door, you, you can do it, just leave the door ajar and hope that God will come in. Or you can go and seek him and bring him into the situation and open wide the door. And of course, that's that's where there's the, the, the analogy really points to. We are not just leaving the door ajar in case God comes by. We are actively opening the door of our hearts, our minds, our families, our nation to God. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens to me, if any man prays to me. Prayer is the true exercise in the human soul to cooperate with God so that his plans and purposes are fulfilled in the earth. Prayer is like the tracks of a train train is powerful but it can't move if there are no tracks so god has ordained that unless human beings request him to do certain things he will not do them uh, he says in james you have not because because you ask not and so we must lay the tracks for god when we think of god moving in our church it's not that we have to do the moving we just have to pray because god says unless you pray i will not move and uh, so that's that's how he's ordained it if you think of it like uh the way we have uh, lordship over certain things god has given us lordship over certain things we are the human race is over the creation and uh, so God says, well, that's your area. And if you are in rebellion, if there are issues you have in your will where you are not submitted, you won't want another power, another kingdom to invade. You will keep that kingdom at arm's length. But if you are submitted to God and say, I want you in this kingdom, I want you in the area under which I have control. Uh, that is what prayer is. And God has said, I won't invade the area that is given to you. That's yours. You must invite me um, into, into your life. I mean, you could take it on a very mundane level. If I wanted uh, some work done in my house, I have to go out and find a builder and uh, get him to come in and agree. And then he comes in and works. Or I try to do it myself. And it's the same with, with God. God says, ask me, invite me. Uh, prayer is the highest activity of the human soul. It involves that faculty of our spirits that can commune with God. When you think that we are made in the image of God, we know that we have great powers of mind. And we, in our minds, we can look at the stars we can long to grasp and understand the infinite world we, we live in, the universe. But much more than that, there is a spiritual dimension to us that longs to grasp the infinity, the greatness of Almighty God. And that's what worship is. Worship is that faculty of our life that wants to commune with the infinite. So, Going on, prayer is a, a longing, a thirsting for God. And uh, in the end, it's the heart of prayer to thirst for God. So you could pray for revival, but not thirst for it. And it's interesting that the things we really long for, we will get. There's a, a word that we will consider at some point 
when Jesus said, seek and you shall find. And he said, you shall find, you shall search for me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. And of course, he's talking about the longing heart, the fact that you must long for a thing. But the negative side of that is if you long for something, you'll get it. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll always get it, but the truth is that what we what we long for and thirst for, we will is really what we are engaged in to obtain. So if I want a lot of money, eventually there's a good chance I'll get it because that's what I'll be uh, my being is directed towards. And if I want God, if I really thirst for God, I will find Him. Cory Tim Boom said, prayer is not the spare tire on the car of our lives. It's the steering wheel. And I love that little phrase because it means that you don't just go and pray when you have a, a breakdown. <laughs> you, you pray all the time because it's what, when the car is functioning well, there it is. Prayer is at the center and heart of your life. You could also use another analogy. You could say prayer is not the fire extinguisher. Um, you know, we reach for the fire extinguisher when there's a fire. That's good. But God wants to be there in the home when all things are working well. And so prayer is not to be just the emergency contact number. Um, prayer is not for the strong who need no help. It is for the powerless who need a miracle. We have to be weak enough to pray. And uh, people say, oh, I, I, they despise weakness. But the truth is in the realm of the spirit, we are all so weak. We, none of us have any power. And as we draw near to the gates of death and eternity, we will be conscious of our weakness and our vulnerability because there is nothing we can do to shield ourselves from what lies beyond the, the gates of death. We need help in eternal things. And uh, um, so we are all weak and as helpless as babes, and we need help from God. And God has to bring us to a consciousness of our weakness. So, so in, our, in our study tonight, that's a definition of prayer. Let's Let's go on now to look at the teaching of Jesus on prayer. When you actually ask yourself in the whole of the um, New Testament, the Gospels especially, when did Jesus teach on prayer? There are a, a number of places. We're not going to cover them all, obviously, but there are, there are a number come to, to, to mind. One is uh, Matthew chapter 6. We'll read that in a moment. Then Luke chapter 11. Um, Luke chapter 18. Prayer comes also throughout the Gospels because Jesus is being approached by people who then pray to him. And so you can learn lessons of prayer th throughout the Gospels, but these are the sections that I've just described when Jesus particularly taught on the subject of prayer. So let's, let's read what he said. Uh, in chapter 6 of Matthew. Now, in this chapter, what is this chapter about? In the, sub, in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6 is the second chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 cover the, the great sermon that in chapter 5, he begins with the principles of entering the kingdom. And uh, the way, the steps into the kingdom. And when we look at the uh, Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, that is the first step into the kingdom. The word blessed is a bad translation. It should be translated happy. And that is, uh, that is true uh, often in the Old Testament. Blessed is the man, it says in Psalm 1, and the word in the Hebrew is happy. And so the word blessed in, in our English translation covers everything from God's favor on our lives to happiness. And of course, God's favor on our lives produces happiness. The keys to happiness are these 
these steps into the kingdom, the Beatitudes. They cover everything that is taught in the Sermon on the Mount. So these Beatitudes could come as an introduction to chapter six, as well as an introduction to chapter five. They are the way we are to cooperate with God in order to be um, the salt and the light, which is the subject of chapter five. We are to be salt and light in this world. We are to have righteous conduct and righteous behavior. And our righteousness is to be real and not just religious, not the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, but real righteousness. And to get that real righteousness, we must uh, come these steps, beginning with the blessed are the poor in, the, in spirit. Um, and of course, righteousness goes on then to excellence in love. We cannot be righteous before God without love. And that's the subject of chapter five. When we come to chapter six, we're not talking about the moral power of the kingdom, but the spiritual power. Um, if, you, if people thought of Christianity as merely moral codes, then all we would teach in our, in, in our churches, and in our, all we would teach is, is how to behave, how to be a moral person. But the heart of the, uh, the law of God, even in the Old Testament, it's summed up there in Deuteronomy chapter 4, when he says, you shall love, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And so when you come to chapter 6, it's not the moral uh, ten, part of the Ten Commandments, which is, chapter, which is from the 5th to the 10th, but it's the spiritual, which is, have no other gods before me, take not my name in vain. And uh, it's all about God and loving him, having a, the Sabbath rest for God, loving God and having making room for God in our lives. The heart and center of the Christian life, we could say, is prayer. By that we mean the connection with God. Um, so we, we may have moral standards, but that doesn't make us Christians. What well, without moral standards, we certainly can't claim to be Christians. But the truth is, the moral power of the kingdom is to be connected to God by the power of the Spirit and to have a prayer life. Uh, when we talk about prayer life, we're just talking about knowing God, loving God, knowing who he is and connecting to him. And uh, so in chapter six, when we come to verse five, he's going to talk about prayer because this is the center of the kingdom. And uh, again, we go back to those Beatitudes. They are the introduction to the moral power of the kingdom and the spiritual. So if you want to pray, you come as one who is poor in spirit. So what does that mean? It means that um, uh, if you take the most poverty stricken person in the world today, I would say probably is Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and I've no doubt he prays. I'm sure he's asking God all the time, oh, God, destroy the enemy and give me favor and all those things, because that's what human beings do when they're in trouble. But he's not poor in spirit and knows it. He's in trouble, but he doesn't humble himself and say, I surrender completely to you in absolute, unconditional surrender. And that's what a person who is poor in spirit and knows it. And there's a difference. Vladimir Putin may be poor in spirit, but he doesn't realize his desperate need of God. I may add that I think that's true of many Western leaders, too, that they think they can trust in the weapons they get from the West or they can trust in the superior uh, power they've got. 
But really what God wants us to do is to come and say, I trust in you alone, poverty and spirit. And you can suddenly see how rare it is for people to really come in that attitude in prayer, that prayer is not just my last backstop or an extra layer of help. It's my only hope. There is only one can help me. And uh, that's God. So we could go through the Beatitudes, but I, I think uh, I'll pass on now to, um, to the, this chapter six. Let's read chapter six, verse five. When you pray, he's assuming you pray. He doesn't say if you pray. He's assuming you pray. And it says the same thing in verse 16 when he says when you fast. It doesn't say if you fast. So he's assuming you pray. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by man. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And the first thing that Jesus teaches about prayer is that insincerity is poison. There is an absolute poison when we pray and don't mean it. You know, somebody says, uh, oh, there's a terrible, and they describe a terrible situation, a terrible illness or a terrible suffering or situation. And we may be distracted. We may be thinking of something else. And then somebody says, oh, would you pray? <gasps> Suddenly you have to think, oh, I've got to pray. Now, how should I pray? How would a spiritual man pray? Oh, and you put on an affected voice. Oh, Lord, this situation. Oh, Lord, it's so terrible. Oh, we come to you. And you and it's poisonous because you're not really meaning. It. You're not thinking. You know, what was their name? And oh, what, what, what was the problem? And you, you have completely forgotten. So you pretend to pray. And, uh, of course, people can hear it in the voice. And we're not that we're sitting listening to each other to judge one another. But... Uh, we can hear it in our own voice. Not that we can judge. Sometimes we can't judge. We judge people outwardly. Only God looks on the heart. Maybe somebody doesn't know how to pray. And we think they're not praying very spiritually. But maybe their heart is reaching out. But we know ourselves when we are praying in insincerity. And he says in verse six, when you and by the way, the word hypocrite is, of course, the word for a mask, because the actors uh, used to wear um, masks. So there would be a cast of maybe five actors playing about 20 parts. And so I've seen this in different uh, theatres where there's if you go into theatres where let's say there's a troupe of five actors and they. They have to play different parts. They'll have a mask and they'll put it on or a hat or something and they'll play the captain. They'll take the hat off. And I've seen it where people put on, they've got a hat in this hand and another hat in that hand. And they'll have a conversation with themselves, <laughs> putting on the different hats or the different masks. Of course, the thing is, he's talking about don't play act. Don't put on the mask of prayer. Don't go into a room and put on an act. Oh, it's the prayer meeting. Be yourself, genuine. And um, so that's what that mean, word hypocrites means. It's actor is another way of translating it, but it means mask. When you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. He's moving on away from the acting. Now, by the way, on the acting, I give the example in the book of Wil Wilfred Grenfell. I've heard two different versions of this, but I quote the one here when Wilfred Grenfell was a, a skeptic before he was converted. And he went reluctantly to hear the great evangelist D.L. Moody. Um, but he almost turned away when he had to endure a long, empty prayer by an elder in the tent that Moody was speaking in. But Moody was suddenly jumped up and said, while our brother's finishing his prayer, let's sing him number and so and so and so. 
Um, Grenfell, uh, I've heard different stories where it was a CT stud, but anyway, whoever it was, I'm sure it's a genuine story. Grenfell was so struck by the down-to-earth reality of Moody that he stopped to listen to him and he was soundly converted. So that's the danger of hypocrisy. So this second thing he says here, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father in, in secret will reward you openly. There's a lot in this. Um, the first thing that would hit anybody who is reading this, especially the Jews, um, he said, Pray to your father who is in the secret place. Go in and pray. Now, the, the amazing fact is that you couldn't go into the presence of God in the Old Testament. Uh, when you think of the, uh, when Jesus died, the veil was torn in two. Um, that meant the priest could now go in. I, I, I think about it and God had God had opened it no man had opened the door the door was suddenly wide open and the priests could actually now see if there was no ark of the covenant there in that time when the veil was torn but if there had been an ark they would have seen it and they could have gone to it and the covenant had changed you can now go in there was no reason now to hang back. God was saying, that veil is torn. You may come into my presence. And prayer has changed through the coming of Jesus. When Jesus taught, in one way, he was, he was, he was foreseeing the, the open door through the cross. He was teaching Three years before the cross, this is his first teaching, big block of teaching, three years before the cross. But the power of it is because of the cross. You can go in. It's simply another way of saying the door is open. You are justified by faith. You are worthy to stand before God and pray. Now, when I when I pray. I can go right in and I can enjoy the presence of God and I am worthy to go in there. The, the high priest couldn't because he was a sinner. But my high priest has gone in and stood there and he's taken me in with him. And I am, I am you, you've heard this story of... Um, I think his name was Bo Lincoln. It was the son of Abraham Lincoln. You've heard this story about the, um, the, the man who goes to see Lincoln uh, as the war is nearing its end. Um, this man had lost his territory, his farm, and he goes to see the president, but the way is barred and the soldiers stop him going in. And so he sits down and, and weeps. And then this boy comes up to him, this 10-year-old boy, and says, why are you weeping? Doesn't, you're not used to seeing a grown man weep. And he says, I wanted to see the president, and I couldn't. And the boy said, oh, come with me. And so the boy leads him. They come to the guards, and the guards salute the boy. And he takes him by the hand, walks through all the guards, comes to the president's room, knocks on the door and says, hi, Dad, I've got a friend here I want you to meet. He needs to meet you. And he takes him right in. Well, Jesus is the one that takes me in. But the analogy doesn't stop there. Because the, boy, the, 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 the soldier then goes away and gets his farm and it's finished. But God makes us equal to the son. So now I have constant access. And I can go and bring others and say, come in, I know the way in. And I don't sit weeping outside waiting for, for a, 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 an intercessor to take me in. I am adopted into the family and have access equal to the Son of God. It's, it's justification is at it's, it's, its most astonishing is that when I pray, God sees me as equal to the Son of God.
I am clothed with all the virtues. Now, when I say this, you might think of the moral virtues, but the moral virtues of Jesus Christ are, of course, excellent, but they are, they are to be seen alongside the spiritual virtues that he was radiant. Um, he was shining like the sun. His face was so pure with pulsating purity. That's my righteousness. When I stand before God, I don't just have, I haven't lied. I haven't taken, you know, I, did, I wasn't given the wrong change at the checkout. And I went back and said, you gave me too much. That's, that's right. But that's not what we're talking about. That's a kind of a minimal, obvious kind of righteousness. What we're talking about is the absolute radiant excellence of Jesus Christ before the throne of God. That's mine. So he says, go in. And that's justification by faith. We're, we don't have to plead with God and weep to get access. We just go straight in. And we must believe and we can receive because God has made us worthy to be in, in uh, to be in uh, heirs with Christ. Let me read to you from Colossians chapter one comes to mind. Colossians chapter one says this. Giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in, in light. We are qualified. <laughs> I am declared worthy. I am qualified. And uh, this, of course, a new convert can think, wow, that's amazing. And be, be kind of stunned by the fact that I am equal to Christ in prayer. But when you think of an older Christian who is feeling now that their prayer life isn't quite up to scratch, they may think, oh, I'll have to have some time of probation. If I come to pray now, I'll have to try and grovel a bit before I get into access. If you haven't prayed for a few days, some people haven't maybe had a holiday from prayer for longer and they're feeling really dry. But the truth is, we never need to earn access. It's grace. And the door is open. We, and we must simply go in, whether we've, uh, we feel we we're unworthy, or however we feel. Some people think, I'm more spiritual than those others. I have a place in prayer that is superior to that lot over there you know i could look at some and say, i pray more than you i know more about i'm quite an expert in prayer and god says well you better stay outside then because the only way in here is through grace you don't merit it you never merit it you never merited it when you first came and now you've become more spiritual and more moral you still don't merit it <laughs> It's still all through grace. And so when Jesus says, go and pray to your father, uh, <laughs> he's talking about grace. Just go in. So we never earn acceptance with God. And this is what Jesus is saying. And um, uh, of course, God is full of grace and a big smile. He says, come on in. And you said, but I've got this problem. He said, yeah, I know. I can see. I'll sort that out, but I can't sort it out while you're outside. Come on in and I'll pat you up. So we've got, we mustn't be insincere. We must go in. We're accepted by grace. And then the next thing is we must go into the secret place, your bedroom. No, uh, if you were in, a, uh, in Livingston's day, your bedroom would have been shared with 10 others because David Livingston uh, lived in a family of about 15 and they lived in a one-room cottage. 
uh, it was a, it was a really they all slept in one room. Um, there was a curtained off area for one end uh, for mum and dad, and there was another area for mats on the floor, and there was a kitchen on one side, and that was what they had. So where was your private room? Well, for for Livingston, it might have been up uh, 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 around the back of the back back door in the in the field somewhere or wherever it was but the point is he's not saying and of course this is true of thousands of people in africa and china and different places they don't have privacy so you know if you've got a big house like we've got here all these bedrooms and the kids have flown the nest you can all you can go into four rooms if you want <laughs> if you're looking for a a private room but the point is that's not what he's saying he's saying this this private room has two play two two dimensions to it one is that in my spirit in my body soul and spirit in my innermost chamber of who i am that's where i meet with god mm -hmm. i the tabernacle had three three rooms if you like the outer court first veil and the second veil so the three parts the tripartite thing and you've got this inner room that's what i have inside me but god has an inner room a holy of holies and when he says go into the inner secret place he's referring to the spirit go into the spirit go into that presence of god because the the heart of prayer is when the human spirit is united with God's spirit and we become conscious of God. When you think of, we'll look at examples of prayer later on in the Old Testament, but they prayed, they didn't have this access. They didn't have this inner, inner room whereby they could merge in with God and be, and, and, and be lost in God. I have that. When I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, the thing that most impacted me was that for days after it after that happened, I was just in awe of the wonder of the presence of God. How real he'd become to me and in me. And uh, the, the tabernacle is a description of a human being and of God. And that's when we go in, we are to go into the spirit. One of the great keys about prayer is praying in the spirit. Just today I heard an, a, 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 a preacher, uh, he was talking about um, this, uh, uh, he was in New Zealand and he was preaching and he was praying for people. And this woman came forward who was bowed down in uh, depression. She was utterly, you could see it on her face, apparently, so we described it, you could see, and he could see that she was a chronic depressive, she got deep into it, and he could also see from the faces of the congregation that they were all looking, what are you going to do about her then, because <laughs> she's a tough case, and he just whispered in the ear of this woman, he must have known, sensed it by the, by the Lord revealing it to him, he said to her, can you pray in tongues? And the woman said, yes. He said, well, do it then. Go on, pray in tongues. So she started, <laughs> really in a miserable tone, praying in tongues. But she hadn't been praying for more than a couple of minutes before the praying took on a different note. And she began to rejoice and believe. And suddenly she broke and she was completely transformed by praying in the spirit. Now, not now, if you can speak in tongues, I'm not saying that all tongues are in the spirit. But God has given us a voice that can reach down into the depths of my heart and I can pray in tongues. I can pray in the spirit. And allow the Holy Spirit. Now you can do this in worship. You can sing. You can sing with the Spirit. 
you can sing from the most inner part of your being. And she, she was transformed. He said he'd never seen such a deep transformation from darkness to light from a woman who knew the Lord but allowed depression to come over her. The preacher actually said he saw the he saw Satan getting knocked right, left, and center <laughs> because the woman was praising God in the spirit. And that's true of you. If you say, you know, I was thinking the other day that we often minimize, I think one of the problems we may have got into in our in our church is that we minimize the gift of tongues. We know it's not the initial evidence. We preach that, we believe that it's not the initial evidence. But it was often the initial evidence. And it was in my case. I'm not, <laughs> I spoke in tongues. And I've enjoyed the gift of tongues. And I've loved it. And I've been blessed by it. And I don't neglect it. And I, Paul the Apostle spoke in tongues more than you all. So he must have spoken a lot. <laughs> so that gift is, a, is an ability to pray in the spirit without but with bypassing your mind use it that woman you know that that story it rings absolutely true because the bible says he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself that woman edified herself and her faith broke free and uh, so he says go into your room go into yourself speak from the heart from the depths of you speak in the presence of god pray in tongues if if you if you are able to and don't minimize the gift and if you don't have the gift of tongues prophesy to yourself <laughs> sing in the spirit sing songs uh, and uh, in the secret place he goes on to say when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. I, I think sometimes I wonder whether the Lord says, didn't I tell you that? Why do you keep repeating it? Why do you keep breaking that rule? Why do you keep saying the same things again? I'm not going to hear you because of many words. It's amazing how people get mechanical about prayer and they say, if I can say something um uh, maybe god will hear me if i can say it 10 times if i can get a million people to say it then god will really hear it god says no i i don't hear words he said i hear faith and if you're trusting in repetition to batter me down i don't work like that and later on he's going to say your father knows what you have need of before you ask him and I've heard people pray. I mean, I've heard people pray. It's happened so often. I was just with someone the other day and they asked for prayer and I was with somebody. So I prayed for them. And then this person next to, he prayed the same prayer. And I think, well, I just prayed that. Why are you praying it? I prayed for their healing and you're asking for it a second time. But I asked, why did you ask for it? you may think but that's how i think if i ask for a thing and you say amen why ask for it a second time just rejoice in the prayer that is prayed if you have faith and uh, we do it so often i hear it all the time people saying the same thing over and over and again pray in faith one of the things that hits you about jesus is how short his prayers were Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> I mean, that raises the dead. Um, but, um, uh, you know, you, I'm sure there's he, he, one occasion he said, if fata, be opened. And the ears of this person were opened. I don't really love his short prayers. Uh, if you like short prayers, just follow the prayers of Jesus. And uh, don't use vain repetitions. The heathen think they'll be heard their many words. Don't be like them. Your father, it says in the verse 8, father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So he's not actually saying uh, you really need to inform God. Oh, Lord, you don't know this big need. And also you don't really know how to answer the need. 
let me tell you how to do it. Lord, I've got a, I've got a person here who needs converting. Give them a neighbor. Uh, and then let the neighbor be a Christian. You've got all these suggestions on how God can do it. And maybe you can pray like that if the Lord reveals to you to pray like that. But God actually has got a lot of ways of answering our prayers, which he is able to do beyond what we ask or think. Let me read the Lord's Prayer. I'm not sure how far we'll, we want to stop in a moment. We'll stop any minute now. But let me just uh, read the Lord's Prayer because he says, In this manner, therefore, pray. And he lays before them the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and you have this consciousness that in the world people have used this prayer and uh, you can almost hear people praying it in so many churches and not thinking about it of course that's completely not what jesus meant in this prayer is contained so many spiritual keys for our lives and i've used this prayer to lead people to christ because there's so much in this prayer. Um, but he didn't mean it just to be repeated over and over again. He wanted it to be a model in the way it's, it presents us with the principles of prayer. So let me read it to you. And as I do read it down, I'll just tell you that it's got six prayers. Let's read the six prayers. Our Father in heaven. By the way, that's a revolution. Moses never called God his father. Abraham didn't. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, David. All through the Psalms, you, you hardly find a mention. I've counted about four in the Old Testament where people say you are like a father. Yes. But here's the revolution. Jesus said, when you pray, call God your father. And of course, this is one of the reasons that the Pharisees really hated him, because you couldn't call God your father. That made you equal, made you part of the family. I'm a part of the family, our father in heaven. And here are the six prayers. One, hallowed be your name. Two. Your kingdom come. Three, your will be done. And all those three prayers, let them be answered on earth as they are in heaven. Four, give us what we need. This day, our daily bread. Five, forgive us our debts in the same way we forgive our debtors. Six, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us. From Satan, the evil one. And then the ends with a praise. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There we have the Lord's Prayer. We will look at it next week. Uh, I'm th next week we will be with the Kleins in their home. Uh, they'll be back from Portugal. Don't think they're online tonight. But we'll be there. Let me just close in prayer then. And uh, we'll open it up for questions and sharing as well. So let me just pray and then we can stop the recording. Lord, I praise you for this prayer that is so exultant. We can pray for the glory of God. I want you to be glorified. By everything in my life, in my life, my speech, my tongue, my thinking, my praying, my living, 
everything about me. I want your name to be hallowed. I want you to be glorified. I want the glory of God in the earth. I want the sick healed for the glory of God. I want a thousand miracles for the glory of God. I want people to come through our doors and find deliverance from evil spirits for the glory of God. I want people to be converted for the glory of Jesus. I want the glory of God. Hear us as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.